right. All righty. We're live. All right. And we're going to let you know. Okay. 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 Peter, could you go ahead and try to mute your phone while you're just listening in? I think there's some feedback. Great, thank you. All right, you want me to go ahead and get started? Okay. Let me pull up everything. All right, good afternoon. I am Chair Anna Sexton, and I would like to welcome you to the August 23rd, 2021 Neighborhood Advisory Committee virtual meeting. And we will now call our meeting to order. The committee consists of nine members, all appointed by a city council with representation from specific community sectors. Members shall be residents of the city or the city's extraterritorial zoning jurisdiction and shall reflect the socioeconomic diversity of Asheville. The term of office is three years. The committee was established to advise the city council on neighborhoods within the city of Asheville's zoning and planning jurisdiction. The committee shall have the following powers and duties. One, to develop rules and bylaws for the conduct of its business, including but not limited to meeting schedules, officers, voting, and subcommittees. Two, develop a plan to strengthen neighborhood identity and resilience and to facilitate communication and cooperation between Asheville's neighborhoods and city offices. Three, develop benchmarks and standards by which progress towards implementing the plan can be measured. And four, work on special projects that are consistent with the goals of the committee as assigned or directed by council. All committee members and staff are participating virtually, and we appreciate your patience as we work through committee meetings a bit differently. We are stre streaming live on our virtual engagement hub, which is accessible through the virtual engagement hub link on the front page of the city website and also linked on the neighborhood advisory committee page. We also have an option for the public to listen live by phone by dialing 855-925-2801 and entering meeting code 9247. For those of you who plan to speak during our live public comment today, um, I believe that is a moot point. I don't think we have anyone here, but you do need to hit star three to be put in the speaker queue. Um, and then for those of you out there with us today, welcome. All right, I will now go through and introduce all the committee members and staff who are participating virtually. And um, for our committee members, please make sure to mute your microphone if you're not speaking. And when you have a question or would like to speak, um, click raise hand and um, I'll call on you to do so. And so as I run through everyone's name, please say a quick hello. And um, a list of all of the committee members is also provided on our uh, meeting agenda. So um, again, I'm Anna Sexton. I'm the Neighborhood Advisory Committee Chair, and I re represent zip code 28806. Um, Bobette Mays. I'm Bobette Mays, and I am the Vice Chair, and I represent at large 28803. Greta Bush is not with us this evening, but she um, represents at large and I think 28805. And then um, JP Chalarka. I represent 28801. Mike Wasmer. Mike Wasmer, at large member. Wendy Hayner. Uh, Wendy may not be here either. I, I don't think we have Wendy uh, yet, but she represents 28804. And then Peter Abzug. Hello, this is Peter, and I'm a member at large. Thanks, Peter. Sharon Summerall. Hi, everybody. It's Sharon. I represent 28805. And then um, our newest member is Elizabeth Likas Worley. And Elizabeth, I'm going to put you on the spot just for a second to ask you to introduce yourself um, and just share with us what excites you most about serving on NAC. Hi, everybody. I'm Elizabeth. Uh, I think I'm an at, I'm an at large member and I live in the uh, Oakley 28803 area and i have been in Asheville uh since the mid 90s so i've lived in several neighborhoods um and i'm really excited to 
uh, dive into some of the issues that uh, neighborhoods are facing and get to know people in different regions. Thanks, Elizabeth. And then um, NAC's city council liaison is Kim Roney. So Kim, if you're here. Good evening. Thank you for being here and for your service. Thanks, Kim. And then also in attendance tonight, we have city staff members, um, Brenda Mills, who's our former staff liaison. Um, Good evening. <laughs> Dala Hitch, who's the director of communications and public engagement. Good evening, everybody. And then um, we also have Lucy Crown with us, and we'll get to that in a minute, or in a few minutes, rather. She's um, a Greenway planner with the city, so thanks for joining us, Lucy. Hi. All right, and so to help um, folks who are tuning in follow along, I'll state each section of the agenda out loud. And um, again, just ask committee members to uh, stay on mute if you're not uh, speaking and then to just click your hand, your raise hand icon and, and we'll make sure we get to everybody. Um, and to also mention your name when you speak so that folks listening in can keep track of who's talking. All right, so with that said, we'll move on to the approval of our minutes for our July 27th, 2021 meeting. And um, those draft meeting minutes are in the meeting materials that were sent out in our folder um, and with our agenda. And so um, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to approve uh, next minutes from its July 27th meeting. And I'll advance the motion. Thank you, JP. Uh, do we have a second? I, I second, Peter. Thanks, Peter. All right, I'll go ahead and run through roll call really quickly. Um, this is Anna Sexton and uh, I. So then moving on to, um, uh, um, excuse me, Bobette Mays. Aye. Uh, J.P. Chalarka? Aye. Mike Wasmer? Aye. Wendy Hayner? Aye. Peter Abzug? Aye. Sharon Sumrall? Aye. And then Elizabeth Likas? Aye. All right, thank you all. That motion carries. Um, and then I'll go ahead and review today's agenda really quickly for those listening in. And so, um, let me pull that up here. Sorry, y'all. It is toggling back and forth. All right. So um, we'll run through um, staff activities and updates after addressing public comment. Um, we'll also run through some unfinished business where we're just sort of buttoning up a review of the volunteer of the year recommendations that um, were made at our last meeting. And then new business today, we've got uh, Lucy Crown uh, with the city who's going to present on the Close the Gap project. And then also uh, Brenda and Dalla will uh, step in for Jeremy since he's not able to make it today to um, present a, a general overview of the neighborhood grants program and timeline and then um, talk about city council meetings and neighborhoods. Um, we'll also uh, provide some updates to NAC um, for other uh, NAC members who serve on other boards. So um, that includes an open space task force update and a multimodal transportation commission update. And then we'll run through agenda items for future meetings. All right, so. With that said, um, we don't have any uh, public comments that were submitted uh, either by voicemail or email for today's meeting. So we'll move on to staff activities and updates uh, from Brenda. Thank you, NAC members. Uh, and it's good to be with you this evening. Um, I'm going to allow Dawa to go ahead and do a little um, update on where we are with the transition um, from my role out of neighborhood services and Jeremy stepping up, as well as looking at um, some stuff coming ahead. Fantastic, thank you, Brenda. Um, sorry, I'm 
listening to the meeting on the phone and here in the meeting. I'm not used to that role. Uh, so the transition, uh, we, we are as an organization so excited that Brenda has taken on this incredible role as the interim equity and inclusion director for the city. We all know she's going to do an amazing job and I could speak for quite a while about all the strengths that she'll bring to that position, um, including a real commitment to working with internal and external partners and being committed to bringing people along on the journey. Uh, Collaboration is really at the core of everything that Brenda has uh, contributed to this organization and kind of who she is as a person. So I share all that because that is what made it tolerable to uh, have this hole that we now have in our department. Um, and she is certainly missed already. And she has a wonderful hire in Mr. Jeremy Lett. Uh, and Jeremy is going to be moving into an, inter into an interim neighborhood and community engagement manager position, which was Brenda's former position. So he will be the primary resource for you all. I know that you all have met him and that he's often in these meetings. Uh, I will be working very closely with him to make sure that he's got the support that he needs to be able to serve uh, the committee well. Uh, and I just ask uh, for your patience as we shuffle our scarce resources around to, to meet all of the needs and invite you all if you have any needs to feel free to reach out to me. Um, this is a very important uh, committee. I, I am a big fan of neighborhoods. It's where I got my start in city government. So I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this work and the, the connections we can all make together. Um, so th that's the transition. Am I stopping at the transition piece? Brenda, keep me straight. Yes, you'll come up later for the other stuff in new business. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And if do you all have any questions for me before we move on to the next agenda item about the transition? No? Okay. Thank you all for your service. Thanks, Dara. Um, this is Anna Sexton again. Brenda, do we do we want to go over any um, other staff updates like in, in meetings or past or um, since you've transitioned out of the that role, is it? Yeah, where do we, where do we stand with that? Some of the big stuff that you're going to hear about is today is about the neighborhood grants and about the um, um, city council in neighborhoods. So that's that's the big thing that's going on right now. Other than um, Jeremy works on several teams, um, to, to put it mildly, he took over most of the stuff I'm doing as well as what he was doing. Um, there's a homelessness working group. We've been, uh, that has gone very, very well, where it's a conglomeration of a lot of city department um, representatives from parking to police to the homelessness need, lead in uh, community economic development, Kathy Ball, there's a bunch of us. So what we're, what we ended up doing is making a listserv, which was the uh, impetus of just, just, just Foster, who's our sanitation director. And once we send out information, everybody gets the same information. So if there's issues, you know, we're having people um, to the point that they're parking RVs now in people's neighborhoods. And so, they're going around responding to that. We also work with Homeward Bound with Robert Stevenson and Hillary Brown. There are representatives on the ground kind of helping. Um, they know a lot of these folks and some they don't, but um, we're working through that. Um, and so there's that. And then um, other than that, I have kind of been out of the loop. So I'm a little, I'm sorry about that. Most of what, most of the updates that you needed came in your neighborhood news on Sunday. So, um, and I'm hoping that that's really being a really good resource. And Elizabeth, I just realized I did not add you to the <laughs> distribution list. But I will forward it to you. I'll make a note and then I'll get you in the system tonight. So my apologies. Thank you. I just written down neighborhood news. <laughs> okay. 
And Amanda, if you don't mind, this is Dow with Hitch again. To, 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 uh, as Brenda was speaking, I realized there's another important piece that, uh, m well, might be important to you all as well. And that is that our entire department is cross-trained in a number of functions. So I wanted to make sure that you all know that the work that Jeremy was doing, our intention is to backfill that and we can lean on our other team members who each are assigned to a different department to keep up some of the momentum that he's been able to generate and support him in that work as well. So just wanted to make sure you all know that, um, that we've got other team members that, that we can pull and lean on as we work through this transition as well. And they're all committed to that work. Thank you. Um, this is Anna too. I just have a quick question. So Brenda, I know like some of the, you were talking about some of the, the groups and working groups that you were a part of and Jeremy stepping into that role. So he'll be taking over also like the technical review committee, like work as well and that sort of thing. Yes. Okay. Um, having lots of fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, I sent a list to all of those folks. We have, we have a lot of we have a lot of multi-department groups. Uh, technical review is just one. Um, we even have a group of folks that was formed about two months ago that all they all we do, all they do is work on compliance. So from sanitation compliance issues to housing issues where landlords are doing things, uh, the police are dealing with homelessness. So all of us meet once a quarter to kind of talk about what's happening, what's going on. We're trying to communicate more um, about you know, when there are things happening on the ground, um, they work better as a group, which is great because they can say, well, I've already seen that. We're handling that, that kind of stuff. Um, and then down to like capital projects, uh, we're, we're, we're winding down with our bond money that we needed to spend. Um, we have until 2023 to get that obligated. So some of the final projects are coming online. Um, you can see a lot of those out, um, on our engagement hub. We have a lot of those uh, noted for the different um, communities that they impact. Um, we try to keep you updated with those in that neighborhood news and on the city e-news that goes out as well. So yeah, he'll be back filling those. Um, I'm still trying to monitor a few things. We're still gonna meet a couple of times a week for a while just to make sure he can ask all the questions he needs to ask and we'll support him at, um, very well throughout you know, this transition. So thank you, Brenda. Absolutely. We'll miss you. So I hope I hope we'll still see you around sometimes. You will definitely see me around and um, I will miss you guys as well. This has been a, a really interesting journey. And when I say interesting, a good, interesting journey with neighborhoods, because I remember being the new person. Nobody can they sort of knew me, you know. And now I'm trying to like, okay, call Jeremy. It's okay. So it's nice. People, this is a welcoming community. And once they get a hold of you, you can't go anywhere. So I've heard a lot from the communities and neighborhoods. And it was so wonderful and strategic that we were able to add Jeremy in February um, because he is he has opened a lot more doors that we were able to open. Plus, we're just going to continue to remind people that he's there. So. I really appreciate it and wish you guys all the best. You too. I'm sure we'll be asking for you to come give us a staff update at some point or presentation. So we'll definitely see you around. All right. Um, we'll go ahead and move into our un unfinished business for this evening. And um, on our agenda tonight is uh, just discussing the volunteer of the year recommendations. So um, those were submitted by the, the working group for that specific task, and that's um, Greta Bush, Mike Wasmer, and Wendy Hainer. And we have um, the typed up recommendations in our meeting materials, so everyone should have had the opportunity to review those. Um, and before I, I hand it over to, to Mike or Wendy or anyone else who wants to chime in, I think Right now, my recollection is we were sort of at the point where um, we just sort of want to make sure everybody is good with finalizing those recommendations. And, and if that, in fact, is the case, 
do we need to take any formal action through a vote or can we just go ahead and okay okay those recommendations without a vote so um i guess that question is directly for you brenda and then i, can I, I think you're good these are your this is um this is a uh, um an initiative of yours so if everyone agrees and has no heartburn with it i think it's fine we just move on unless somebody has some changes or additions they want to make Great, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll open up the floor if anybody has any comments, changes, or additions that they'd like to consider for incorporation. I would like to make a motion, uh, Anna. This is Wendy Hainer, who is part of that committee, is for everyone to have an opportunity to read the proposals that we have written out and uh, then come back next month and all of us agree on the procedure that we're going to follow. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody was able to review that in enough time. Um, so that my pr proposal. Thank you. Brenda has raised her hand. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna say that so that you can move this along, um, actually Greta went over all of these last meeting. Um, all this is is a typed up formal version of what she went over last meeting. And I'd be glad, or if you don't mind, to go over like the four points that, that you guys are trying to make, which is really good. Um, so I can do that or you can do that if you would like. And then from that point, um, if people still have a little hard born and want to wait, um, because you're going to have other issues that are coming up. So I think, you know, this is good stuff. Um, this is Anna, and I agree. I'd like to go ahead and move it along. Um, yeah. And unless anybody has heartburn, and um, we can certainly have folks go over some highlights again, but Bobette, please go ahead. I see your hand. Uh, because of being conscious of time, and I think that everyone has read it. It's uh, we've gone over this before, so uh, let's continue on. I think it's we're all right with it. All right, very good. We'll go ahead and. Um, make those recommend or I guess approve those those changes or recommendations to the whole process and just want to say thank you to Greta, Wendy and Mike for the thought that you put into that um, and for putting together what I think is a very sort of clear and concise process and I'm hopeful and excited that it'll generate some more applications um, in the future when um, we're looking at highlighting some of the the folks in our community for the good work that they do. So thank you for doing that. Um, we will go ahead then and cross that off our list, which feels really good, and move into new business. Um, and with that, we will start off with a presentation by Lucy Crown on the Close the Gap project. Um, presentation materials for this uh presentation were also added to your meeting materials, I believe, um, this morning. So you can find that resource there. And just want to say thank you to Lucy for taking the time to present. And I will turn that over to you now. Loretta, Kim has her hand raised. Thank you. Kim, please go ahead. Um, just for my own um, sort of notes that I take during these meetings, I didn't hear a formal acceptance of the recommendations from the presentation that just happened. So are, will those, um, I'm looking to see where they're at, Neighborhood Volunteer of the Year Award Working Group recommendations be formally accepted at a future meeting? Or are they going to be accepted now? And if so, will, will there be a vote to formally recognize them? This is Anna. Thanks, Kim. I think that that was my original question was, do we need to take a vote? And it sounded like we don't, but we certainly can if that's the process that we need to go through um, for formality. So um, I will go ahead and entertain a motion to approve the um, 
Well, volunteer of the year working group recommendations as presented at our July meeting. Mike Wasmer will make a motion to accept the changes to the neighborhood uh, recognition Turn award. Left. And I'll second. Thank you, Mike. And then we have a second from Bobette. Mm -hmm. So I'll go ahead and r run through um, roll call. All right. Bobette Mays? Aye. Elizabeth Likas? Aye. JP Chalarka? Aye. Mike Wasmer? Aye. Peter Abzug? Aye. Sharon Sumrall? Aye. Wendy Hayner? Aye. And then Anna Sexton? Aye. So the motion carries. Thanks, y'all. All right. Now we'll go ahead and transition to the Greenway Updates presentation from Lucy. Hi, everybody. Can you hear my voice? Yep. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to the NAC meeting to talk with you. Uh, Brenda told me that you would like a quick update on the gap plans and Greenway stuff. So I um, am happy to be here today to let you know what we're doing. This happens to be a really important week because uh, we are about to start another round of public engagement for our Close the Gap plans. Our Close the Gap plans um, stand for Greenway, ADA Transition, and Pedestrian Plan. And we um, started working on this before COVID. Um, this, is, this has been a longer planning process than normal uh, because well, public engagement is super difficult. So um, because public engagement is such an important part of our planning process for these three plans, um, we've been trying to gather as much information as we can virtually. But this time around, um, we're hoping to be able to do a little bit more physical outreach, um, fingers crossed. So um, to explain what we're doing, I think I can give you um, a more poetic understanding of what we're trying to do. And I have a video that is attached to your, um, to your packet today in my slide presentation, but I'm gonna pop out of this and turn it on in a different video player so it's clearer for you to see on the video. My name is Roy Harris, and I have been living in this neighborhood now for 36 years. I stopped, I stopped counting. And the South Side neighborhood, as people refer to it, I am the unofficial line of the neighborhood. Once I retired, I decided just, you know, since you want to be living in this neighborhood, just check it out. And so I started to walk the neighborhood. I've been walking ever since, the last four or five years, just walking the neighborhood. And I can see the changes that are happening in the neighborhood. I'm Anna Grace, and this is Caroline Parker, and we live on Lakeshore Drive. Walking down Lakeshore Drive with two dogs and a baby is very challenging. There are absolutely no sidewalks on Lakeshore Drive. Regularly, there are cars that pass by that are only a few inches away, and to go eight houses to get off of Lakeshore Drive, and it is incredibly stressful. My name is Matt Lee. I was born and raised in Nashville. I've been living with a spinal cord injury for 21 years. Um, it is not merely a medical condition or injury anymore. It's become a part of my identity and how I navigated and live in this world. With the sidewalks uh, in the city, especially 30 years after the ADA was passed, there are still many challenges. Uh, whether it's uh, inaccessible uh, curb ramps or trash cans, 
a broken sidewalks, it prevents me from being able to pass through. Oftentimes, maybe someone could just step over it or walk around it, but for me, uh, it makes it impossible. And Grace Curry, John and I have lived in Asheville for right around 19 years, just off of Chernobyl Street. Well, what, when I moved here, I found out that there was a Charlotte Street corridor plan that was essentially a, it is now called the road diet, and the city had adopted it. Primarily, the reason we wanted to live in the area we did was that we wanted to be able to walk, and there's also a bus nearby, and not have to rely solely on the car. My name is Dave Nutter. I'm a neighbor here. I live just around the corner from this lovely Reed Creek Greenway, which I use every single day. I walk about five miles a day, uh, and it's very good for me in terms of health and relaxation and quiet. And you can really think on greenways. You can sit and rest and relax. You can meet old friends and make new friends. My name is Judy Davis, and I've lived in Asheville since 1998. I walk with a yellow lab guide dog. His name is Prince, and he's been my partner for about five years. And I really enjoy walking in Asheville. I usually walk twice a day for about 90 minutes each walk. Sometimes I tell folks, look up 10 degrees, and it's a whole different world. 10 degrees and you're like, oh, I never saw all of that. Part of that is because your eyes are here because bad sidewalks. There's several different parts to walking safely in Asheville for me. Part of it depends on the homeowners. Like there's places where there's brush that hangs over the sidewalk. So occasionally I end up with scrapes on my face, which is not very fun. Also, if the trash cans could just stay off the sidewalks, that would make it much easier for me. We can back the man of Nashville and all of our MBAs on Saturday and the Rivers District of Washington. And River Rivers District attracts a lot of tourism and the sidewalks give people the ability to just leisurely walk by, stop into, get a cup of coffee, and like do all of that safely. So we appreciate them. <laughs> I have lived in other areas of Carolina and haven't noticed as much sidewalk traffic as I have here in Asheville, just given the beautiful environment and the climate, so sidewalks are definitely a necessity. Hi, my name is Gwen Whistler. Greenways are important to me because they allow people to get transportation. They actually get someplace without a car, either riding their bike or walking. We live near a greenway and kids use that to get to and from school. They learned how to ride their bikes um, on the greenways. You can have incredible outdoor experiences right next to your own house if you've got a greenway you can get out on and that would have an incredible impact on so many people's lives if we can just make it easier for everyone to get outside i'm claudia nix i'm mike nix and, and we, we are, are the owners, owners of the Bikes. something that i've been working on for over 40 years is to get greenways and bike facilities that are safer for people and what started me working on that was when I started having customers say to me, I want to sell my bike. I don't feel comfortable riding in this community. It was extremely mountainous, the roads are narrow, and if you're sometimes some roads you're taking your life in your hands to ride on. And feeling comfortable is one of the main things that's important about having dreams. I've seen a lot of progress. We are connecting jigsaw puzzle pieces of greenways. The greenways by the river are amazing. I love the wide, safe sidewalks. It was engineered perfectly to allow anyone's passions to be put on the way. Like if you like hiking, walking with your family, walking your dog, running, you can do all of that over there. And I just, I think it's amazing. It's important for me to be able to access um, these places. Um, Fully of charge without any hindrances, riding bikes, just going for a walk and, and relaxing. And that's part of being human. And that's part of the benefits of places like this. And I'm encouraged 
uh, and pleased with the efforts of this city to uh, improve accessibility, to incorporate more inclusive universal designs for pedestrian ways and sidewalks and greenways. And it has greatly improved my access and others so that I can be a better part of the community and participate. Charlotte Street Road Diet has really been implemented in the last six months. Certainly for pedestrian traffic, it, it's a big improvement as far as I'm concerned. There are a lot more places where you can cross safely. People do have to stop. It's more comfortable. It's more pleasant. Just recently, they did a, a lot of nice work on Kenilworth, so I don't have to worry about water collecting in gutters, which was really nice because there was a lot of times I didn't end up with very wet feet. You know, I really appreciate what the city did there. Over time, the city's done a better job of putting the capital investment into those areas where there can really be a big benefit. What could we do to make our greenways better? We could have more of that one and really focus on keeping them clean and maintained? Well, in this place in particular, when it is busy, um, parking is an issue. Parking on Lakeshore Drive would be a lot better if we had a sidewalk, a lower speed limit, and maybe a possible police patrol to catch people that are speeding. A lot of places in Asheville, the, the sidewalks are actually pretty narrow going forward. If the city could look into having a strip of green between the sidewalk and the street, that would give me a little more comfort. The first thing I would do to make the sidewalks better on the south side is do a better job of cutting the grass. In the side. I think the hard thing is it's hard to ever get a timeline. Like you communicate things, problem areas, and it could be months, it can be years. For folks with disabilities, you're just waiting and you can't use things, you can't access things. So I think it does help to, to kind of know when things might happen. Asheville itself is so beautiful. Asheville needs greenways just to reflect the lovely environment that it is in. And they really count for bringing people together and making better neighbors of us all. Well, I I hope you guys like that. You're the first the first people I've shown that to you. So, oh, and I don't need to show it to you set two times. So, uh, one of the big things that we're going to be doing starting this week is uh, having a couple of virtual meetings. They're the same meeting, so you only need to attend one. And if you aren't able to attend one, we will record them and have them on our project page which is um, AshevilleNC.gov backslash close the gap. But I usually tell people Google close the gap Asheville and you'll find it just as quickly. And again, this is my um, email address, which is also on that project page. If you want to share it with your neighbors, please do. I, I really want to hear from people. Um, we, we had a lot of people respond to our last survey that was in uh, December. It was, uh, it was between um, Thanksgiving and Christmas, and we extended it into the new year. And um, we did receive almost 2,000 responders. Um, however, I did not hear a lot of comments from 28803, 28805, and some of the legacy neighborhoods in the 28801 neighborhood. So I'm really trying hard to reach out to all neighborhoods to let them know that we're interested in hearing from them. Uh, this is a, what's called a master plan, and it is a very important document for us planners in that it really sets our, it charts our course for what we will be putting our efforts into for the next 10 years. And so it's important to, um, for us to hear from neighborhoods and be able to reflect that in our plan. Um, and I understand that this is something that could easily be overlooked. I mean, it's not addressing an immediate problem. And I know that there's a lot of 
bigger problems out there right now for a lot of neighborhoods. But um, if I could just be able to share people's time for a little bit in the next month, two, three months time to be able to get a more comprehensive idea of what people are looking for in their neighborhoods right now, um, it's super important because if it's not in the master plan, it's really hard for us to get projects implemented. So that's, that's it for our uh, Close the Gap. Um, before I open for questions, I just wanted to give you a brief update on what we're doing with greenways. I hope all of you have been down to the Wilma Dykeman Greenway in the River Arts District. It's open now. It's two miles long on the east side of the river. Um, it has almost 20 feet width of multi-use path and, and um, dedicated bicycle paths. Um, it's already very busy. It makes me really proud to see people from all different parts of Asheville down there enjoying it. And it was named after Wilma Dykeman. She's a long time, well, she's passed away now, but she lived in Asheville for a super long time. She's from the Beaver Dam area. And she was a very well-known writer. Um, people, what people might not know about her that for her, for I'm sorry, for her time that she was writing her books, she was also a very progressive feminist, environmentalist, and concerned for racial equality. So I was very happy to see her name um, being used for this important greenway in Asheville. We also are working on the French Broad River Greenway. The last section in the city of Asheville um, is closing the gap between what is behind New Belgium Brewing Company and at the French Broad River Park where the dog park is. We're also doing that little section underneath Amboy Road that's a dirt path. But this is a one mile long greenway that uh, we just started. So we will be working on it for the next 12 months. And um, we'll be working with garden groups to feature edible plants. The, our first step will be working on what exists there now with the just edible plants that are indigenous to our area and that grow naturally, but we will be working on some more organized plantings with garden groups that are willing to um, steward those and very excited about that. And the Nasty Branch Greenway in the South Side neighborhood, uh, we are about to be in construction on that, if um, God willing and the creeks don't rise, <laughs> if that's the way they call it now. Um, this greenway was planned in 2014. We've had close funding for this project two different times, and we finally have the funding secured and are finishing up the stormwater requirements on this greenway to be able to start construction uh, this winter and most likely this spring coming up um, because asphalt companies close in the winter time. So this, this greenway is going to feature the story of the South Side neighborhood before urban renewal. And I hope give a great story for um, us today and in the future to understand what happened to the prospering community that was here. And then uh, the third project that we're working on right now is the first phase of the Swannanoa River Greenway. This is a one mile section of a seven and a half mile long greenway corridor, which will eventually meet up with Amboy Road where the um, Wilma Dykeman Greenway ends now. This section will begin at Glendale Avenue, which is just on the south slope of Oakley and um, in the industrial neighborhood of the Swannanoa River Road area. And it will go behind all of the businesses um, that are on the end of Thompson Street following the curve of the Swannanoa River and go underneath the South Tunnel Road bridge and the 240 bridges to meet up with the Walmart Greenway here, the River Bend Greenways it's called. And then we'll come up 
and go over the bridge on Bleachery Road and terminate at the intersection of Bleachery and Swannanoa River Road. And uh, the reason we're doing this section is one, because it's entirely off road um, through this area. So it's not a section that we could wait for the DOT to um, work on a road project and get involved with those kind of constructions that are great for cost efficiencies. Um, so but at both ends, right here and right here, we are waiting for the DOT for them to do the Swannanoa River Road um, road improvements, which were slated for 2024, but have been pushed back by the DOT because of funding issues to 2030. So um, this one mile section is what we have to work with in the meantime, and we're very excited to be uh, getting that started as soon as the designs are done. And we are currently at about 60% of the design phase. So we'll be done hopefully within three months, three to four months, our designs will be ready and we'll be moving straight into construction because it is funded by a transportation bond project. And as Brenda told you, we need to have those funds um, activated by uh, 2023. So that's that's my presentation. I don't know if you have any questions, but I would love to hear from you. If not right now, please contact me if your neighborhood is interested in talking more. Wendy? Oh, you're on mute. Yes, thank you, Lucy. It was a wonderful presentation. I ha do have a question from the Wilma Dykeman Greenway all the way up to the Botanical Gardens over at UNCA. Is there any look, is that a possibility to finish that Greenway? Yes, thanks for asking that we have money to do the engineering for that section. And um, I hope to put out a request for, um, it's called Letters of Interest. So, uh, I was hoping to do it by this month, but I'm a little bit too busy with the gap right now. So it might be September when I release that to look for a consultant to work with us on that one mile section. Right. And then at that intersection of Broadway and Riverside, uh, we will also be doing a feasibility study for the Reed Creek Greenway to finish that section. And the town of Woodfin is also about to, um, well, when I say about, I'm talking in Greenway time, it's probably like two years from now when they'll start constructing their multi-mile section into Woodfin too. So three Greenways will meet at that intersection eventually. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? I see Elizabeth's hand. Oh, Elizabeth. Yeah. Hi, Lucy. Thank you so much for that information and those graphic, those images are really uh, neat and that's exciting. Um, I, I know you mentioned that first phase of the Swannanoa River Greenway. Where in the priority list is the Thompson Street from Biltmore Village up to Glendale or any connect, anything connecting to the Wilma Dykeman across Biltmore Avenue? So there's no active projects right now. However, the Thompson Street, Swannanoa River Road area still continues to be a very important part of our Greenway master plan. And it's not just the city's master plan. The county identifies that as a spine greenway for them. It is part of the Fontaflora State Trail, and it's also part of our regional Hellbender Trail. So it's a really important area and we were, it was disappointing news to find out that the DOT needed to postpone their Swannanoa River Road section because we were really going to push to have our greenway built at the same time that the road improvements were happening. Uh, but if there's a silver lining, it is that we have a little bit more time to plan and make it a really awesome place. And I still keep Thompson Street in uh, my creative brain and working with partners on some ideas on maybe ways that we can utilize Thompson Street in the meantime. I don't have any plans to talk about, but it's something that would be nice to see. Thank you. 
Thanks. Um, thanks, Babette. I think we're going to wrap up here in just a few minutes. But Lucy, for folks who may be a little bit less familiar with the project, could you run through sort of the, the anticipated um, timeline for the remainder of the project and sort of some of the big milestones? Yes, sure. So we're at the middle, the intermediate part of the plan. We've um, done analysis. We have figured out how to assess the current conditions and we've taken input from a public survey and we've combined all of those things. And now we have essentially a draft plan that we would like to, you know, throw at the wall and see if it sticks in pasta terms. So um, this is an important time for anyone who's interested to check in, see if we have your neighborhood correct. If you have any questions about how the plan looks in your neighborhood, please contact me and we can have a longer discussion about it. Um, I am really, really wanting to talk to the zip codes and the neighborhoods that I didn't hear much from the first round. So um, don't be shy and I might be coming knocking on your door anyway. And um, after this, this phase of input, we'll be um, wrapping it up. Our goal is to have the plan completed in a direct, final draft form so that we can show it to all the boards and commissions that are interested in seeing it and then giving it to um, council in January for approval. Sharon, do you have a question? Hey, Lucy, it's Sharon Summerall. You've helped me with a lot of my questions on Urban Forestry Commission. Um, I represent 28805. And there's a lot of concern about the Bowcatcher Greenway. And I don't want to give you all our major concerns because we've been to council on it with the amount of Urban Forestry Commission concerned about the 600 trees, all the retaining walls. So instead of inundating you with my neighborhood and other boards and commissions I'm on, how far down the road is the Bowcatcher uh, Greenway issue? Do I need to input now our continued concerns on uh, on that particular greenway or should we just cool our jets while everything else materializes? Uh, well, it's, it's a great time to give comments when we have that open survey. So tell your neighbors to please um, use that opportunity. Sharon, if you and I could have a conversation after this meeting sometime so I can get more details on what are your concerns. Um, there is some money set aside for the Bowcatcher Greenway in this year's budget, but uh, we are up to our eyeballs in transportation bond projects, so I don't know how far we can get with Bowcatcher at this time, but we are looking at a modified version of Bowcatcher, which would cut down a lot of the um, retaining walls and the need to get rid of trees. Okay. Um, um I'm, I've been talking to you about this through the last three years, and you probably don't remember. And all of us in the neighborhood did respond to the, uh, uh, to the I, I forget what you call it, that you sent out to everybody online. Mm -hmm. And we did respond to that. But I will, uh, we have not seen nor had at that time, um, has there been any new plans being submitted that we have asked for to see? There's nothing to submit because it's the same the same one that we all have seen many times. All right. right. I'll just check in with you and then um, and keep you updated on how we feel about it and then just keep you apprised on it. And okay. I appreciate all your work and questions you've helped with me and our neighborhood on it. Thanks. You bet. Thanks. This is Anna. Um, we are sort of running short on time, so I'm going to let Elizabeth ask her a uh, question and then we'll wrap it up after that. Thank you. This is really quick. Uh, Lucy, just to clarify about the survey, is this a new one that's about to come out? Right. It will come out Wednesday, the day of our first meeting, and it will be on that project page, the Close the Gap Asheville page. So I will. How long, how long will that survey be uh, available? We plan to have it up three weeks, but I also am going to, if there's enough interest, I will be visiting neighborhood groups for as long as it takes to be able to talk to everyone while we're working on this plan. Great, thank you. 
This is Anna again. Lucy, thank you so much for that presentation. That video got me in the feels uh, a lot. Um, <laughs> this well, is, now you see what the problems are, right? <laughs> I mean, I actually just finished up an ADA plan for a small community through my professional job, and um, this stuff is really important. And I think it's great to remember that um, NAC is part of our role is advising council on a host of things, but this is a very, very important and significant way to do that, albeit indirectly through the feedback that we can provide to city staff and through promoting um, public engagement to our networks so that they can provide comment to city staff on what they want this plan to look like. And it also, as Lucy mentioned, is really important because um, it, it having having plans in place for various um, aspects of the transportation network opens up funding and cost sharing where we don't have to foot the bill the entire way. So it's really important stuff. And I know everybody wants more sidewalks in town. So um, thank you very much, Lucy. Thank you all. Thank you for your service. <laughs> all right. Take care. Have a good night. You too. All right, we'll um, quickly move on to, sorry, pulling up my notes here again, um, the overview of the neighborhood grants program and timeline. Um, Jeremy was going to present on that, and I think Brenda is going to step in and provide us that update tonight. That will be the lovely Dower Hitch. Oh, you guys get me. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Dower. Okay. No, I'm happy to do it. This is something, uh, back to that, uh, my passion really lies in neighborhoods. After many, many, many years, I am, I am thrilled to say that we will be launching a citywide neighborhood, neighborhood grants program, and it will be launching this fall. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, what I'd like to do tonight is to share an overview with you all, uh, kind of the why behind it and some high level uh, pieces to what it's going to look like once it's executed. And then I certainly want to hear if you all have any questions, because that is going to help us as we finalize the final pieces to really know where people might have more questions so that we can do a better job communicating, anticipating questions that might come. So. I really look forward to hearing any questions you all have about this process in general. So what are they? It will be a matching grant program. Uh, Jeremy, I, I need to give a nod to him and all of the hard work that he has done to get this program up and running. Uh, it has been, when I say um, we could pick a couple different po points in time, uh, we could go back, I know, as, at least as far as 15 years where we started our journey with these types of grants and then it kind of fell to the wayside. And then I think it came back up with our council probably two or three years ago. And so we've been kind of waiting for there to be a solid decision that this is what we're gonna do and here we are. So it will be a matching grant program and it will be a dollar for dollar match up to $5,000. Now that can be in kind, so it does not necessarily have to be actual cash on hand to meet that match requirement. Um, applicants must be from a geographic region within the Asheville city limits. So, so it's limited to uh, folks that live within the city and um, I guess if there are three things that I would want you all to take away from this. It would be the, why, why are we doing this? What do we hope to get out of, of this investment? And that is certainly to build neighborhood capacity. People bounce that word around a lot. Like what, is, what does building capacity mean? And building capacity really means self-determination, right? Where a neighborhood can say, look, we know what is most important to us because we live here and we think these things, investments in these ways will improve the quality of life in our neighborhood. And we're going to put some skin in the game to help make this happen. 
So, so building that capacity, our hopes are, and we've seen it happen in other areas, and we've seen it happen with work that we've done within the city, is that once that momentum gets going, then that group of people tends to be more active in the decisions that impact their daily lives. And, and that, that is something that we hope will never stop growing, right? People's access to the everyday decisions that impact their lives. So, um, again, making sure, so another point would be that, that, that neighborhoods are really taking the lead in determining what's most important to them. I know I mentioned that before, but it's a really critical piece of this. And then strengthening those partnerships between the governmental organization and the neighborhood. So, if there's a grant, for example, that has something to do with um, a neighborhood sign, let's say a neighborhood wants to do that, then there will be resources available, some technical assistance, and then that uh, work with our development services department to get all the permits and the things that would be needed to erect that sign. And our hope is then that that community through that experience has had hopefully positive experiences with our DSD and can help their neighbors and others navigate through that process, right? So that we've got folks that are building safe structures and they feel like our DSD department is a department for them instead of something that might feel a little bit scary or confusing, you know, often, often the public works building where they live. So those are some of the goals of this program. So if it's wildly successful, we hope at the end of the day that that those things are that those things are achieved. And there are, are some criteria that have been drafted, uh, and I thought that you all, if you don't have any question, kind of big picture questions about what is this thing all about, we could move into what some of those different criteria are gonna be for, for any of the grant funds. I see some nodding heads, thumbs up, fantastic. So one, it must be achievable in 12 months. And so at this point, I'll share and we'll revisit it again. That part of the process will be that, that there will be, once the announcement goes out, the grant period opens, there'll be a six month, period and then we're going to do it again and I thought that this was a brilliant uh, approach uh, that was recommended by Jeremy and Brenda because you know all this happened under Brenda's guidance and leadership as well uh, especially since it's a newer program and 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 because 12 year 12 months is a long time and so we'll have this initial window and then folks may see things happening that are positive and other neighbors, they may be inspired and we wouldn't want them to have to wait 12 months to be able to do that. So, so there will be six month periods where folks can apply for these funding or for this funding. Um, of course, it needs to occur within the city's limits and provide a public benefit and be accessible to all members of the community. That's a really important piece of this, that whatever investments made through this, these grant funds, that it must be accessible to all members of the community. And that it must be planned, organized, and implemented by community members. And then the dollar for dollar match. And this certainly isn't the only time that you all will hear about this. We wanted to just kind of, as the process was moving along, making sure that we were providing you all with updates uh, because having you all as ambassadors for the program with accurate information is going to be a great is going to be a great benefit to how successful it can be. And we really appreciate all that you do, not only for this grant program, but in all the other information that you all share. So there are some of the criteria for the program. Um, now, one before I get into the timeline, one thing I did want to spend some time on is is who's eligible 
And so our, our goal, and so, so here are some of those details. And Brenda, I, I would invite you to jump in to make sure that um, I've got this, because I know some of this is has been a little bit fluid. So this is not a finis finished product that I'm sharing with you all, but it's some of, it's the, the foundation, the foundation is there. So, so it is not limited to existing neighborhood associations. I feel like that's very important because I know I've heard some feedback. Brenda has heard some feedback, some concern that some members of our community might be left out of this process. And I want you all to hear that it, it is not a requirement that you've been an established neighborhood association. Hopefully we might inspire some groups within a geographic region to form a neighborhood association. Could be a homeowners association. It could be a residence council, right? But that there is some kind of network formed around this geographic area that can sustain itself after this. And then we would encourage those folks to make sure that they're registered with the city so that again, we can share information and begin Begin to just add to that community fabric that we have of which neighborhoods are such a critical part. So I, I wanted to at least share that piece of the eligibility just because we have heard some concern that that some people might be left behind but our intention is certainly for this to be an opportunity uh, for for any anyone in our community that wants to organize and kind of tackle things at a community level, that this will be an opportunity for them. Brenda, did I leave out anything critical that you know? Really that's care? absolutely. I think one of the things though, is that you only get to not be registered once. So the next time you apply again, we're looking for you to get your neighborhood registered. And I've, I've talked to you guys about this before. It's basically filling out an application and providing information about your neighborhood so that we have a contact and information you know, for future, you know, outlook and everything. And while we do not expect you to be like an established neighborhood, you must get majority vote from your community. So there'll be some form that we're creating, Jeremy created, Well, you'll have to get. Um, so Anna, if you want to just do it in your neighborhood and it's just the surrounding 30 houses, you need to go get signatures from those houses that says, we know this is happening. We want to participate. We will volunteer. That will talk a little bit more about the matching part. But um, we hope to build community and build neighborhoods uh, with these grants. So not, you know, if Sharon just wants to go off rogue and which I would love if she'd come rogue and plant stuff in my yard because she's excellent. But she just wants to go off rogue and East End, which Renee's not going to let her um, and start doing stuff without talking to the neighborhood. So we. We want to build that camaraderie, which they certainly have in East End. Yeah, yeah, that 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 camaraderie is so critical. It's so critical to a healthy, vibrant community, right? A resilient community. Sharon, a, a quick question. Um, I'm on Bowcatcher, and we have a huge amount of dead trees and things that need repair, and things that fall on our vehicles and. Uh, mudslides, and we have all kinds of infrastructure issues up here on, on Bowcatcher Mountain. Can this money be used to help uh, some of the infrastructure issues in our community if we get community support to, you know, fix trees that are falling over on us all the time and, and that kind of thing? Can it be used for physical aspects like that? So I, I, I'm i going to give you an in general, yes, there are opportunities for those types of projects. I want to be very careful. I do not want to overpromise. And if anything, what I hope folks will walk away with is that this will be in partnership with the city, right? So it so so understanding what things like um, this one I know is a sore spot for for some neighborhoods. If a neighborhood that has lower outcomes for emergency responses asked for a speed hump. And I, I don't think that that is a project as far as it being a, or a speed bump, let's just go all the way, right? Y'all know the difference between speed bumps, humps, and I don't know, there's other, 
other there's one more that has a raised sidewalk all of that that would i don't that would as a speed bump that might not be something that that the city could commit to but i think that there will be i think the intention is with this grant funding for that to start the conversation of what could work right and speed bumps couldn't we wouldn't be able to recommend that because it would go against our policy for our fire trucks and other emergency services to be able to get to people faster um, speed bumps slow them down speed humps don't so i you know that building that relationship and and kind of understanding what any limitations might be is an opportunity that we have within this so thanks for bearing with me with that example because it does get complicated kind of quickly but yes, yeah, so physical structures, um, one that I thought was great that came up the other day was, well, we, we live in a uh, public housing neighborhood and we have issues with, with cars parking where they don't need to be or where they're creating a danger. So could that be something that these grant funds could pay for to have a private towing company come in and tow the cars and that absolutely is is a project that would fall within the criteria of this kind of fund now we would then we would need to get into all right what does the match look like and and all of that but um I, we want neighborhoods to be creative, right? Like what, what are, you guys know, you know better than anybody. All of us, the people living in our neighborhoods, what the greatest challenges are. So yes, it can be anything from landscaping, murals, community art, cultural festivals, public safety solutions, marketing and branding for your neighborhood, organizational development for your neighborhood association, our we know that there are lots of funds federal and state that come with a lot of um, restrictions and strings tied so our hope is here with this money at the local level that we can have more opportunities for creative solutions wendy yes thank you so much for recognizing me um one of the uh, neighbors hoods in my area is norwood park and they have a path that goes from Raymouth Road all the way down to Murdoch, and it's a shortcut for uh, the um, neighborhood. Uh, this was built back in 1920. We're trying to determine if this is part of the city's responsibility or the neighborhood's responsibility, and we're having a difficult time looking at that on the city maps and trying to figure out who's responsible for it. But this is a project that they're wanting to take over and uh, improve. It's been many, many, many years since this has been uh, rehabbed. And we have numerous children walking on this, walking all the way down from their neighborhood down to Merriman Avenue to catch the bus, things of that nature, and to access the, uh, the main road. So those are the projects that they would like to see. And I'd like to know how we would be able to determine if this is a city responsibility or a neighborhood responsibility. So I, I would say certainly we can work with, well, Brenda, I don't want to step on your toes. I know you've got like one foot in, you got one foot at like one toe still no, in. No, 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 you're fine. So, so just be, just be mindful that whatever you apply for must have city approval. I think there's some place on the, um form for you to have a buy-in like who who's approved it what they're going to approve and some of that may be helpful in that if they were going to work on it anyway you may can partner with them with some of your funding but remember your funding is going to be limited so i are we still at five thousand dollars dowel yeah so yeah. um and if you are interested or, or, or not sure, Jeremy can hook you up with the appropriate department and they can talk to you about who owns the land, is it city, is it DOT, is it who, and make sure that you get to partner with them because they would love that. Yeah, yeah, and and I, if, if Wendy, if you can, 
if I don't remember, because I want to be mindful of our time, uh, when we were talking about the timeline, some, some office hours, technical assistance is going to be an important part of this grant process. And it's, I, I, it's certainly during that time that I'm imagining, we're imagining that neighborhoods can ask those types of questions and, and have somebody to help kind of navigate through that. Anna, I saw your hand raised. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm really excited about this, and it sounds like there's been a lot of forethought put into it. One thing that comes to mind for me is that the funding on the city's end is finite, right? So is this going to be sort of like a rolling uh, submission or application review process where you know, if something comes in and there's still money available, um, everything, all criteria is met, we're going to go ahead and award funds to them? Or are, is there any discussion about possibly ranking or prioritizing um, applications in any way with seeing, you know, potential um, acknowledging various equity issues, I guess? down the line or maybe it's a fluid process and you kind of see how it how it starts out and maybe tailor it along the way to address that just so i think anna yes to both of those so, so yes I, and I, i've heard and am excited that the team believes that this should be a fluid process there's been an understanding from the very beginning and a real commitment to we want to be able to adjust and pivot as necessary and to go into this right off the bat with an equity lens in mind. So the criteria that has not been finalized, the selection process that hasn't been finalized, and I'm happy to um, share with Jeremy that that NAC uh, raised the point that that could be a valuable approach. Just to affirm that he's kind of, I think he'll appreciate hearing that, that he's kind of on the, on the right track. Um, Right, because we do, right, it, it is. It, it, we have a finite amount of money now, and of course we can't bind any future council to any budget decisions. So the intent is absolutely to invest all of those funds into neighborhoods through some kind of program. So if that means that we need to open up a third six month or a fourth six month period with that original funding, we're certainly willing to do that. I know we've got the support of our budget, uh, budget team to help with all the administration behind that as well. Thanks, Tala. Yeah, um, timeline, you got real quick. I'm not gonna run through a big one, but just what's next, what, what can we expect next? So in October, that is where we are, when we are planning to go out into, go out to the community, I guess virtually, and our intent is to take a, more comprehensive approach to funding opportunities so that we're going to so we're going to package this initial these initial meetings about this funding opportunity with the ARPA funding and then we're also partnering with the county so that we have all of these different buckets of funding that we can communicate to our community at the same time so so there if what it's looking like is there'll be kind of a big get everybody together, a high overview of funding opportunities, you know, government investments in community. And then we'll say, if you're interested in the neighborhood grants, go to this breakout room and then you get Jeremy and he's going to run through the details of that. And then we can expect after that, that he's going to have additional time office hours set up to work with community members. But we have heard and recognized that, there are a lot of people looking for opportunities and they might not always be the best fit for one. So we're trying to address that and say, hey, there's a bunch. I know you heard about this one, but it might not be the best fit. Like if the neighborhood says, like, we got this $20,000 idea, we might be able to say, here's another fund, here's another funding source that might better hit you or better serve your needs or meet your needs. So we want to be able to share that information comprehensively. So October 4, uh, October is, is when we're looking at launching kind of that comprehensive government investment funding. Not quite sure yet what we're going to call it. 
but um, it's, it'll be around that time when we expect we'll be able to launch the neighborhood grant program. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, if you don't have any more to share on that, I think let's go ahead and transition to the city council's uh, meetings in neighborhoods so we can kind of make up for some yes. time and get everything in. Yes. Thank you. And this one will be, so I, it came to me that uh, there, I, I think it's our boards and commissions council subcommittee uh, had, had, had some real interest in talking about council getting out into communities. And I know that that is also something that you all have talked about. It's something that you all have led at different points in time. And my hope is to just hear from you all about what you think some valuable approaches might be. So in your recent conversations or something that we could offer the subcommittee to consider is, do we want to explore if we can bring an actual city council meeting into a community? One that would look like any other one that's held in the city council chamber, has a typical agenda, you know, public hearing, you know, consent agenda, public hearing, new business, all of that. Would we want to explore bringing a meeting like that into neighborhoods? Or do you all think and have, uh, do you hear from, from the neighborhoods that, that you serve that something more along the lines of what we've done in the past where there's an issue that's identified by a geographic area and then council comes to listen would be more helpful or we could go even way back and we could do, um, they weren't attended very well, but, but we can do anything. Uh, we can't do everything, but we can do, we can do many things. Another option is where we just say there's a East Asheville, you know, city council meeting and there might be some presentations and then people from the community can share their thoughts in general with the city council. So there's a couple. So, so I know that there's some interest in this at the council level and wanted to give you all the opportunity to kind of weigh in to to share what you think would be meaningful, impactful, helpful for the neighborhoods you serve. Share it, and you all can think on it. This doesn't have to be the end of the conversation. I know I'm just kind of dumping an idea on you. Sharon. This is a much needed idea. Um, my involvement in other commissions, boards and commissions. Um, You've got a subcommittee going on, and so what you want is you want some ideas that uh, might resonate with the, uh, the neighborhoods. That would be how can we get information to council members? Um, well, yeah, the subcommittee, yeah, they've said that they're interested in going out into neighborhoods, but that could look a lot of different ways. So I'm hoping to ha yeah, have some intelligence about what would be meaningful from y'all's perspective. Right. And so does that, have you come, to, I don't know how far along you are in this thinking process or working, is that uh, an every six month thing or is any, you have for, not formulated any ideas on anything at all. So you're just open to any ideas that, um, uh, which is great because we have a lot of ideas. So do we send those all to you? <laughs> I, that, that work, uh, that, Brenda, does that, does that work? Like procedurally, it's okay, but certainly okay by me. You could send it to the neighborhood um, neighborhood services email. Well, let me ask you a question. We're pretty sure it came from boards and commissions committee, council boards and commissions committee. I We're think, not sure. I think that it's going to be, a, I think there was an ask for it to be an item on their agenda. There's Miss Kim. She's going to answer it for us. Yes, Kim, you probably know. I think it was set for September and we said, well, hey, great. We've got a neighborhood advisory in August. Maybe we can get some input to share as the committee starts to deliberate. Kim? Right. I think there's a, just a seeking um, 
an appetite, but also which direction we would head because the Neighborhood Advisory Committee has done um, meetings. I've attended them. So when I was the president of the East West Asheville Neighborhood Association, um, there was a meeting about the noise ordinance recently or noise issues. Um, but before that, there was one um, in the Hall Creek neighborhood. I know that was maybe four or five years ago, though. So should it be around a specific topic? Um, should it just be accessibility in general? I've also attended one, um, maybe it was four budget cycles ago at Hall Fletcher about the budget. Um, there were maybe 40 staff in the room and maybe four people in attendance. So I think finding where the need is most will be important. Um, and then as has already been mentioned in this meeting, um, using networks in the neighborhoods to um, do outreach will also be really helpful. Thanks, Kim, so much for, for that additional detail. Very, very helpful. Anna? Sorry, Sharon, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, Kim, with that in mind, knowing that there is a September meeting coming up um, and wanting to take advantage of sort of the window of opportunity that we have right now, um, what kind of when would be best for us to sort of collectively as NAC maybe get some information to city staff to then share with you all, like deadline wise? Oh, I would say um, two weeks before that meeting, but that's going to be coming up soon. Um, so you could send it with, to staff and you could carry it to me as well as if you like, because I'm on the boards and commission boards and commissions committee um, and I'm happy to distribute it. Thanks. Oh, Sharon. Yeah, you know, I've changed my mind after listening to Anna, but from my experience of working with other neighborhoods in my own neighborhood on NAC and 28805 is that there is a, when there's a large development or a large change in a community is when everybody coalesces and starts trying to get information to whomever will listen at the city or at the council level before uh, the development uh, becomes the end result of it. And that has been my experience of all of a sudden it's putting out fires when a huge development comes in and changes the whole aspect of a neighborhood. And then you've got all these people uh, sending stuff to council. You've got the developers talking to council. You've got the, the people talking to council. You've got all a whole load of stuff flying around. Um, for me, if there was a, uh, a council involved with a neighborhood meeting when it's a large, uh, what we consider large development change in a neighborhood is getting it in the beginning so that the neighbors feel like they're being heard when something is changing the whole, uh, uh, the whole look of their neighborhood. Does that make sense? And But I wouldn't know how Absolutely. to co co coalesce that down into how does that work? Uh, all of a sudden, we've got a big development going in over here. Most of the time, the developments are a year uh, before they hit uh, 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 the process of submittal to the city. So, And then the neighborhood meeting sometimes is only like a month before the project hits TRC for review. So there is this real crammed in period. And I would say for working on the organizations I work on, if we could make the neighborhoods be able to have a say in what's being developed with council would really alleviate a lot of this uh, uh, trying to put a fire out that could have probably been headed off way beforehand. But I wouldn't know how that would work or, or even how to tell you that. But So I'm going to send you an email that says council involved in the neighborhood uh, uh, large building uh, changes in the neighborhood and meaning all of the things that are attached to that. So that makes me think about just in general, um, it's always easier to get to folks to show up when there's a problem and harder to get um, sort of advanced input. But we also um, know that folks want to be asked before a decision is made, especially if we don't want to see people um, with the concern that decisions are being made about them without them. 
Um, so an example of what that could look like um, is I know that the Reparations Commission will be doing a process. So maybe we could do some neighborhood meetings around that. I heard that come up in the listening sessions. Another example could look like the Unified Development Ordinance updates um, before we get to a point where they're in draft mode, um, but really hearing concerns from neighborhoods in advance. But it is difficult unless the Rolling Stones are in town to get a big crowd. Um, mm -hmm. without a problem already in place. I have to um, go back to my other job right now, but I will review the rest of this meeting and look forward to what other input you've offered. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kim. Um, this is Anna again. Uh, it's 6.30. I do think that this discussion um, warrants continued conversation, um, whether that happens sort of offline in a way where we're not violating any quorum issues um, via email or uh, potentially adding it to unfinished business at our next meeting. Um, so maybe exploring both of those options um, because I think um, Sharon, you've already shared some really good ideas and sort of um, made me think about some some things as well. And I think this would be really good for folks to sort of mull over and, and come back to. So um, if you guys are, Brenda, go ahead. Let me share that, you know, in our engagement hub, we set up an email, just like with your meetings, there's an email and a voicemail for you to leave comments for city council. Let me encourage um, you guys, I'll follow up with an email and um, give you the link to their, their upcoming, as soon as it gets set up, I'm not sure if it's set up yet, and get you the link to that because that's a great way to email in and just let them know you're, you know, you're a part of NAC, that you wanted to offer this suggestion, you know, and go from there. Um, that's one way to do that. And then if somebody wanted to share a document, I don't know if you guys are comfortable with Google, most of you are, and offline, you guys just start adding suggestions and topics. Um, I do think that if council is, if like if people know council is going to be there, I think people will come. And especially, you all know the issues that you've been having. Homelessness, development. I mean, I could go on and on and on. So those are the, some of the main issues. But what you guys have really been focused on is development. So I, so I think, you know, starting with that, maybe, and, and then just look around, like, what are your, what are the questions you have and what are the process needs you need and, you know, in order, you know, for council to just answer your questions. So just, just some suggestions to, uh, because their meeting is usually the set is the second Tuesday. So you don't have long. <laughs> and, and, and I, I want to share that, that there, this, this was an idea that hey, this is something that we could talk at at this committee. So, so the whole concept isn't really far down the road. And even this first meeting in September, it was to start the conversation, the idea generation. So, I, I, not that I'm discouraging you all from getting that information, Brenda, that's brilliant, absolutely. And, and the public engagement hub for that committee meeting would be ideal as part of the public comment and identifying yourself as, as a NAC member, as Brenda said, um, could help shape that first conversation. And then I, I'm certain that there will be more. Uh, as as the ideas fleshed out a little bit, but if we could start off from the very beginning, that was the thinking. Man, if we could start off from the very beginning with some input that might help, kind of get the conversation started in a in a way that will be helpful to neighborhoods in the long run. And this is Brent again. I just had a second thought that um, you may just want to formulate something as a committee and send it over um, by email to um, the board and the commission's committee um, liaison, who is Sarah Twilliger. Thanks, Brenda. This is Anna. Um, yeah, that was actually gonna be what I was going to say is, um, of course, folks should feel free to send comments to city council individually at any time with, with ideas or feedback. I do think that if we came to some sort of collective um, idea or path forward as a committee, there may be a little bit more um, 
it may be a little bit more convincing um, to council as a whole. Um, but also, yeah, in the interest of time, want to move on, but just want to say thank you, Dawa, for thinking um, about engaging NAC from the very beginning. I think that this is what the committee is really looking for um, in terms of advising city staff and city council and um, feeling like we are able to offer some, some interesting ideas and good input. So just want to say thank you for doing that, and we look forward to seeing more of that um, in the future. Um, but let's, uh, Sharon, do you want to um, <laughs> uh, maybe take the lead on this, not to volunteer you to do anything? But there's nothing to say much on open space other than we're working on uh, the RAD, River Arts District Open Space and RAD. A lot of that property down there is owned, owned by NCDOT in the city. And... Um, we're having uh, discussions with uh, 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 many groups of people that are involved in the city and in the RAD. Is that me? Back? Sorry, I hear feedback. Um, and um, I think we're almost headed towards the end of it so that I can actually submit something that will mean something to somebody. Uh, we're dealing with open space percentages on protected areas. And I don't know if all of you know that just because an area is protected doesn't mean it can't be built on. It can be built on even if it's protected. And so what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, keep areas that are protected and keep them from being built on and then saved in perpetuity so that we recognize the fact that builders can come in and you can actually build anything anywhere if you've got the engineering and how we protect some of our uh, our open spaces, our wetlands, our steep slopes uh, from being uh, inundated, uh, allowing developers and builders and homeowners to do what they want and protecting what we can uh, for the future. It's been a, a very long, difficult conversations, and but that's where we're at now. And um, we're coming to resolution for the, all of this, which is kind of a miracle. So um, it's been, as Anna knows, it's been uh, hurting cats, but it's been good. So that's my short, short version of that. Thanks, Sharon. Yeah, that was, uh, for folks tuning in, that was um, our member updates on other boards where Sharon and I are serving on the Open Space Task Force to um, propose some amendments to the current ordinance language regarding open space. Um, so I'll go ahead and move into updates on the Multimodal Transportation Commission. And we had a meeting um, just after our July NAC meeting. So that some updates from that include um, staff discussion on a Federal Transit Administration grant opportunity for 50 Ashland Avenue. And um, folks can also look in the Asheville Citizen Times, uh, there was a story that came out about two weeks ago that talked about this as well, but um, the city is seeking a federal grant um, for $850,000 um, to sort of rethink the um, Talbert lot that was re recently purchased by the city and develop it into, uh, I think, a truly sort of transit-oriented development that combines like, affordable housing and transit and transportation opportunities. So um, at our, our meeting, uh, Jessica did say that it's probably um, unlikely that the city gets selected for that grant, but it's a really cool opportunity. And the city has already put some really creative thought into um, applying for it. So fingers crossed that, that maybe we do get that money. Um, the Multimodal Transportation Commission is also revisiting the city's bike share plan, and we should have a revised draft plan of that coming to us for review soon that will um, sort of explore e-bikes, but also kind of separate those from um, scooters. So um, I'll have more updates on that later. Um, we're continuing to... Uh, or multimodal is continuing to have a representative um, at the table with city staff and NCDOT um, to meet regarding the Merriman Avenue um, 
finding ways to leverage some safety improvements and uh, multimodal opportunities along that corridor while um, resurfacing happens. Um, so not waiting for a full like redesign, but trying to take advantage of some things that are happening in the near future because of just how dangerous that corridor is. Um, so don't have much more to update you on that, but we also did um, pass a motion at our last meeting to recommend to city council to lower the default speed limit in the city to 25 miles an hour. Um, so what that means is um, basically that's what the po that's what the speed limit is unless um, you go through a process like usually through like an engineering speed study to determine maybe a higher speed limit based on the the type of road that it is. So um, that's just one tool that multimodal has has thought would be a good way to lower speeds and and make streets safer. Um, that's that's about it. We have our next meeting um, two days from now. So um, yes, uh, Elizabeth, I see your hand up. Yes, this may be um, a uh, question for another time, and you can tell me if one of you can explain it to me later. But the close the gap and the multimodal commission sound like they're addressing the same thing. What it what is the difference there? Sure. So the close the gap plan is an actual planning process that the city is going through to gain. Uh, feedback from the public and also engage in, you know, best planning practices to develop this document that will be a blueprint for greenways and accessibility and the pedestrian network for years to come. So, so once they're done with that process, the city will have a planning document in hand that they'll reflect back and, and look back at when they're making decisions for uh, project prioritization and budgeting um, that sort of thing. The Multimodal Transportation Commission is another um, uh, boards and committees commission uh, entity that focuses on, uh, it's all, it sounds obvious, but on multimodal transportation. So you're looking at pedestrian, walking, bicycling, um, transit, how we can come together as a committee to inform city staff on how to make um, Asheville safer for all users of the transportation network. So um, think of it sort of in very oversimplified terms, you know, neighborhood advisory committee is, is sort of advising on a very nebulous concept of neighborhoods, but multimodal is advising on this concept of transportation and how to make it safe and accessible for everyone in the city and policies related um, and projects. So um, NAC has a liaison on the Multimodal Transportation Commission. So that's why I'm serving in that role right now. I'm NAC's liaison to that. And I'm a non-voting member on MMTC, but I do attend every month and then provide updates for for both NAC and MMTC at each meeting. So I hope that's helpful and happy to to answer more questions about that if you have any. Okay, thank you. So so the close the gap is the process for gathering the input and putting together the plan. Multimodal is more sort of long standing, lots more than just what the close the gap does. Absolutely. Yeah. Wendy, I see your hands up. Yes, thank you, Anna. Wendy Hainer. Um, I have a question for you uh, pertaining to multimodal. Is it possible to consider putting uh, traffic cameras at traffic lights uh, since we have such a decrease in police force and with the traffic um, speed limits going to be at 25 miles an hour? That does not work very well, even on Kimberly, because they are speeding and the speed limit is dropped down to 25. We need cameras. <laughs> um, thank you, Wendy. This is Anna again. We That is actually something that has come up in conversation um, quite a bit on multimodal. And I think right now um, the feedback that we've gotten from the city is that there are a lot of um, 
you could the city could be legally vulnerable in um, installing traffic cameras for speeding. Um, there's all sorts of state regulations and other precedents set. So um, we're still exploring that as a potential option. Um, in other cities, I see that they have them at every one of their lights. Uh, traffic lights so it's it's all and that's all up in Pennsylvania and right it's in a different state um but yeah I'll you know I'll look back in um previous meeting notes and see what I can find for you about um conversations that we've had regarding that and and some of the sort of sticking points as to why we might not be ready to or the city might not be ready to to go that route um all right, I really appreciate you all staying around past 6.30. Um, we had a lot of really good information and a lot of really important information to share at this meeting. Usually, um, we're pretty good about ending on time, um, but we do have some um, on our agenda, uh, just some items and ideas for upcoming meetings, including um, some board training, um, which we're looking at for beyond September. So that's something that we can come back to. But I think for September, we're hopefully going to have an update from community resource officer um, in the Asheville Police Department um, to provide a reimagining public safety update. Um, we're also looking at um, getting um, staff, city staff to do a presentation on the technical review committee and, and um, what that committee does and how NAC might be able to get more involved with that. Um, but I'm also hearing from folks that maybe even um, some other ideas like looking at um, traffic calming policies uh, or the city's traffic calming policy, looking at how um, neighborhoods could get connected with the transportation department to um, address traffic calming in their neighborhoods. So um, I'll work with, with Dala and Jeremy um, over the next month or so to finalize our next meeting's agenda. Um, and wanna go ahead and wrap this one up so everyone can get on with their evenings. And so our next virtual, or excuse me, our next regular meeting is scheduled for Monday, September 27th, um, 2021, and it will remain virtual. And um, as always, you can check on the city's engagement hub for more directions on how to participate. And so I will now um, adjourn the meeting unless we have any objections. All right, we are good, so adjourned. Thank you all, thank you Dawa and Brenda and all other city staff. And thank you NAC members for attending and 